Hello and welcome to The Future is Cooperative. I'm Richard Crispine, CEO of Collaborate Up and your moderator for today's session where we're going to talk about how people, organizations, and countries will need to both compete and cooperate. Some now see a strife-ridden era punctuated by the potential of a second Cold War. Growing great power competition and rising nationalism and regionalism. While acknowledging these realities, I think we're going to find that the future will involve a mix of cooperation and competition among organizations, countries, and regions. So in today's panel, we're going to explore how the cooperative future will shape trade, security, and politics across the globe, both in the real world and in cyberspace, how politicians, business leaders, civil society, and more might play a role in creating greater and more evenly distributed prosperity while also avoiding civil strife and armed conflict, and what legal frameworks, business deals, multilateral institutions, and people-to-people connections we will need and how we're going to go about forming them. I'm really privileged to have a great panel of, of, of great thinkers here with me today. On the panel, I've got Karan Bhatia, the Vice President of Government Affairs and Public Policy at Google, Congressman Brendan Boyle, representing the state of Pennsylvania, Bonnie Glick, the former Deputy Administrator for the U.S. Agency for International Development, Ambassador David Gross, the former U.S. Coordinator for International Communications and Information Policy, and Dan Rundy, Senior Vice President and Director of the Project on Prosperity and Development at the Center for Strategic International Studies. Welcome, all of you, and welcome all of you who are dialing in today uh, and listening in on this great conversation. Please do make liberal use of the chat if you want to chat in some questions. We'll try to get to as many audience questions as possible, as well as my own. But, Karan, I want to come to you. Uh, You were President Bush's Deputy U.S. Trade Representative, and you're currently the Vice President of Government Affairs and Public Policy at Google. So I want to start with you because the last four years made many people question the future of multi-stakeholder and multilateral collaboration. What's your prediction, and what are some examples that we should be thinking about? Richard, first of all, thanks. It's great to join you. It's great to join such a, a terrific panel. Look, I, I think the future is going to be a combination, honestly. I think we, uh, I, I love this idea of uh, cooperation. I think it captures a lot of what we're seeing out there, uh, 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 both as, at, a, at a sectoral level and, frankly, at a, at a multinational level, at a, at a nation state level. I think um, the technology sector today is one where we see vigorous, vibrant competition. Um, some of you may have seen the Economist cover story from a couple of weeks ago, which showed uh, just how competitive it is. It's competitive uh, among the big tech platforms. It's competitive globally. It's competitive with startup. It's a wonderful thing. It is a dynamic, innovative environment. Competition is good, but globally, we're also seeing a great deal of of of, of uh, sort of lack of 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 cooperation on the nation state level which is making it increasingly challenging. We're seeing new barriers come up. We're seeing new rules and regulations come up in a lot of sectors, which really makes very challenging uh, for companies in the technology and other sectors to deliver the promises, to deliver the opportunities, the benefits really of, of a global platform. So a company like Google, whose mission is to make the world's information universally accessible. We're incredibly proud of what we've been able to accomplish in that regard, but it is more and more challenging as we see a future that is increasingly uh, disaggregated and increasingly competitive. Um, So we're seeing opportunities on the one hand to continue to innovate, compete, and continue to be able to grow, provide services around the world, but we are also seeing that competitive dimension, particularly between countries, the fraying of institutions, the fraying of norms, which is making it more challenging. So we're seeing an increasing competition, which is good on a commercial level, but on the nation state level, that's creating a more complicated situation that may inhibit positive competition and innovation in the future as regions and nations seek to utilize regulations and laws and other things to potentially fracture economies and fracture trading relationships. Am I getting uh, that exactly. Right? I think that captures, that captures it well. If I can add one final thing, Richard, one thing mm-hmm. that we are seeing, though, some newfound partnerships and, and collaborations between companies 
and and government entities. I think that's sort of a, an interesting new mode of cooperation. So just to take one example, in the COVID crisis of the last uh, year, we have been able to find sort of incredible new partnerships with institutions ranging from the WHO to many, many uh, country health authorities, for instance, to get out in information that is so critical to uh, people looking for guidance on how do I deal with COVID? How do I, how do I get tested? Um, we've had some fabulous new partnerships spring up uh, with the World Bank, for instance, uh, with, internet, with the OECD, with other international institutions to try and bring uh, important information forward. So again, another interesting dimension on this cooperation competition notion. Here's an example of great cooperation that's moving forward to the benefit of millions of people around the world. Terrific. Thank you for that. Um, great perspective and hopefully a, a ray of, of hope uh, amongst some of the darkness. Um, Congressman Boyle, you're a Democrat representing uh, Pennsylvania's 2nd District. You also serve on the powerful House Ways and Means and Budget Committees. I know you've just returned from the floor where you were voting on, on a series of bills, but uh, thank you for being here, first of all. And reflecting on what Karan just said, Brendan, what do you think the future holds when it comes to international trade, multilateralism, and common rule setting that might impact some of the things that might bring about the kinds of prosperity that Karan and, and his colleagues are trying to create? Well, it's great to be uh, with you, Richard, and my fellow panelists. I do want to describe up front, as Richard said, I just came back, actually ran back from the floor uh, from votes. We are still voting. So if at some point you see an empty chair, it is not because Richard asked such a difficult question that I just ran out of the room. Uh, although, come to think of it, that is a pretty good technique for ducking a very difficult question. But um, as, as far as this, I serve on the House Ways and Means Committee and specifically the Trade Subcommittee. So this is right in, in my wheelhouse. Um, as I think about it, we take a step back because multilateralism, let's face it, has been challenged internally in a way the last several years that it just wasn't before. So that prompted me to take a step back and really analyze the, the world in which we live and in many ways this world order that we created. So look at it like this. We essentially are, are 75 years in to the world order the United States created. All of the great post-World War II institutions, the rules of the game. Now, for the first 40 years, the big threat, the big challenge to that came from the Soviet Union and from communist expansionism. That threat died. And now for the last 30 the threat has largely uh, been different and harder to put a finger on it. I would say the threat, frankly, is now from within. And so we see that manifest itself on trade. We have seen a rise in anti-trade sentiment. Obviously, there's always been some trade skepticism uh, within the Democratic Party. But as we've seen over the last four years, there is a lot of anti-trade populism now within the Republican Party. We have seen internationally some Western democratic countries where, frankly, there has been a democracy recession. So the question is, what do we do forward? I wrote an op-ed that appeared in The Hill not too long ago when I elaborated just a little bit on this topic and I focused on the World Bank. But that's just one example of a number of institutions, most notably, I would say, NATO, that it's about time those of us who believe in this world order, who believe in multilateralism, actually go on offense and defend them. Frankly, I think we've been caught uh, asleep. We have just assumed that people would accept these, that they are good, and haven't uh, offered an affirmative case, and now they are being challenged internally here in the United States, but, but also, um, also abroad. Brexit was another example of a challenge of uh, multilateralism, although specifically in that case, the European Union. So some people think, uh, and, and frankly, I would say some of my fellow Democratic elected officials might think that now that Donald Trump is out of the White House, that that element of Trumpism is gone. I, I strongly disagree with, with that view. I believe that the challenge to multilateralism, the challenge to the world order that we've created is still with us and will still be with us for a while, and if those of us who believe in that don't do a better job of making an affirmative case for the benefits of this order, we will see it go away. 
So this is a world that we created. We, we as Americans created, and we now the, the, the biggest threat to it is not an external threat, but it's an internal threat, as we've seen in the rise of this anti-trade sentiment, sentiment as well as a, a recession. I love that term, a democracy recession in many Western powers. And it's time for those of us, I think I'm sure many of us on this panel, to stand up and advocate uh, for that. Um, Ambassador Gross, you're the former U.S. coordinator for International Communications Information Policy. Uh, reflect on what, what the congressman just told us. Do you, do you agree with him that uh, this kind of anti-trade sentiment, which has you know, come to the fore in the Republican Party and perhaps has always been lingering there in the Democratic Party, and that is also sort of present in some of our Western allies, is the biggest threat that we face right now? Well, first of all, thank you very much, and it's a pleasure to be with, with on such a great panel, uh, particularly with many old friends. Uh, it's always a great pleasure. Uh, but I agree very much with what the congressman just said, and I say that not just because he's the congressman, but in fact, I think he's right. Um, I, I think, in fact, if I could even expand on it, I, I think the, the issues that he's talked about are certainly correct, but I think it goes deeper. Uh, in my experience, and uh, is that... Uh, to negotiate about things of importance, negotiating from a position of strength is always key. That's true in your personal life. It's true between and among countries and so forth. And the key for us is, uh, for the United States, is to be true to our basic core principles, which have served us so well for so long. The Congress talked about certainly uh, for the post-World War II period, one can argue for even longer. Uh, there is a reason why the 20th century was the U.S. century. And it wasn't just because of, uh, you know, that we're nicer people or something like that. It's because we had an approach, and we still have that approach, of freedom, of democracy, of capitalism, without trying to get too specific about what capitalism means, but basically a market-based approach that allowed for people to be able to increase the quality of their life and the lives of their families, uh, and the people that matters to them. And we were, you know, as Reagan said, we were a shining city on a hill. And that was a key part of what America is all about. And it's why countries want to work with us. Countries want to be with us uh, for a variety of reasons. But at their core, it's because they see it as in their best interest. Because we can help them do the things for their people to make their lives better. Um, and I think that if we stay true to that, that's really the key. I'm always a little um, amused uh, when you read in the newspapers and magazines and so forth that somehow if we just get back to doing things through a multilateral process with allies, that somehow everything will be fine. You know, the world is not basically an algorithm that if you just put a couple of things in, we'll get a much better result. Instead, the world is a very customized place, and you have to be very nimble. You have to be very uh, clear-eyed about what is important, what is not important, what people want, what people don't care about. And for governments and in negotiating in these things, that is the always, uh, in my experience, the key to success. We don't want to be convincing people to do things because we want to do it. We need to convince people in other countries to do things because it's in their interest to do it. Mm -hmm. I think that's very much the core of what the congressman was talking about. Mm -hmm. So uh, we need to know, I want to follow up on a couple of those points though, that you raised there. You, I, I heard you very much about we need to stay true to our core values. We need to have an offer that is in the self-interest of, of ourselves, but also of our potential allies and partners, particularly uh, around the, the hopefully a still attractive package of a free and democratic system backed up by prosperous capital ca capitalism and, and capital markets. Uh, but you mentioned this point about negotiating from strength. Uh, what do you mean by that? Well, I mean, you know, strength comes in many flavors here, uh, and it's not one size fits all. Strength comes from a domestic strength, you know, the country, a prosperous economy, a sense of optimism, a sense that we are doing things to make our lives better. That takes into account the problems that the United States has. By no means am I suggesting that we don't have very significant problems. Everybody does. We do. They need to be addressed. We need to work on them. We need, as I think we have over 200 plus years, become a better 
place, a better union uh, for all of us. Uh, we need to continue to make that progress. So the core is the strength of our purpose, our strength of our values, mm. our strength of our economy, our, and our view of cooperation at our core, cooperation with the world. doesn't mean everybody, but those who seek to cooperate with us, we do so with open arms. That has been a core piece of our culture for mm. throughout the 20th century. One can argue even before that, but sometimes more clearly than other times, okay. perhaps. Uh, yeah. But looking ahead to the 21st century, that is the recipe for success, in my view. Excellent. Um, Congressman, I'm going to come back to you on that point in a minute uh, and, and kind of get your thoughts on, on how we can better negotiate from strength. Uh, but Bonnie, I want to bring you in. Bonnie, you were the uh, deputy uh, administrator there at the U.S. Agency for International Development uh, under President Trump. Uh, how should we be working with our allies, reflecting on what Quran and the congressman and, and, and uh, the ambassador just told us? What should we do, particularly when we're dealing with, co- with companies who perhaps don't like to play by the same rules of that system that Brendan referred to, and also who may be our commercial uh, competitors. Thanks, Richard, and thanks, everyone. It's great to be here with, with all of you today. Look, healthy competition is a good thing, uh, and I think we should all herald it when we see it. It keeps free markets strong, uh, and it tends ultimately to provide consumers with lower prices and higher values. So it should be promoted, healthy competition. And there are calls from some corners to exercise something these days that's more akin to industrial policy and to promoting uh, or protecting certain sectors in the United States. On some level, that's probably fine too right now. There are industries in the United States that would do well to promote that we would do well to promote and and on some level protect in order to reinforce the security of global supply chains. And I think that one of the lessons that we've all learned from COVID was just how vulnerable we were due to a supply chain that originated and ran only or mostly through China. And I'm sure that all of you remember it was just a year ago when there was a mad scramble for PPE all across the country. From my role at USAID, it turns out there was a scramble for PPE around the world. There were stockouts on everything on Amazon.com, and the global supply chain really had a monkey wrench thrown into it, and it was thrown off kilter. So I think that many of us quickly recognized the need to find better ways to secure our supply chains. And this is where the coopetition comes in. We would become used to the efficiency of just-in-time delivery, uh, but that came at the expense of no redundancy built into our systems. One of the things I started to talk about when I was at aid was the need to onshore, nearshore, and allied shore our supplies. It certainly doesn't make sense for the United States to invent or reinvent industries here for the purpose of manufacturing that could be better suited in other countries. But the criticality of ensuring that supplies are available either through domestic manufacturing or manufacturing nearby in the Americas or or manufacturing in reliable allied countries. Uh, will some of the near shoring or allied shoring companies also be competitive with our industries here in the United States? I hope so. Uh, companies and not governments will find a natural competitive balance and It'll swing back and forth between competing companies, but all of that, I think, is good news for consumers. And the key is ensuring that our supply chain doesn't once again become beholden to a single source. And in the case of the pandemic, that we not be dependent on the People's Republic of China. So thank you, Bonnie. And, and Dan, I want to take this to you. So what I'm hearing from from the from uh, the congressman and from the ambassador is that in some senses, uh, trade policy is domestic policy. And so is, uh, I, I guess, it's international trade policy is also, or international development policy is also domestic policy because there has to be a domestic constituency for it. At the same time, you know, the congressman says that we built the rules-based system, but as, as, as Bonnie kind of pointed out there, China doesn't necessarily like to play by those rules. 
And we also have to be make sure that our own supply chains are not vulnerable to either shocks like a pandemic or bad actors on the other side of it. So from your, your perspective there, CSIS, Dan, what can or should we do uh, working with our allies and cooperative partners to build more resilient supply chains that work for the American people? Thank you. Uh, first, I just want to say I'm so pleased to meet Congressman Boyle. I'm really encouraged by his comments. I'm so glad we have leaders like him. I'm a Republican and I'm saying this, but I'm really glad you're in the Congress, Congressman. That's really great. Um, I would say a couple of things. I've been on 500 Zoom calls since March the 12th, and I've taken away a couple of deep thoughts from my 500 Zoom calls. I won't list them all here, but I would say two, two couple of things that are related to this. One is that we're going to get some kind of partial economic div- economic divorce from China. I don't ever want to have my pills, PPE, or ventilators dependent on the Chinese ever again. We're going to call it different things, China plus one, resilient supply chains, allied shoring, near shoring, what have you. We are going to see tectonic shifts in global supply chains. We ought to be using our foreign aid as a lubricant to kind of lubricate that kind of what's called trade facilitation, trade capacity building. There's lots of terms for this, but this is coming. And I also think we ought to follow and enable a lot of that with sort of new trading agreements. And I think we've done every trade agreement we've ever done has had a geopolitical or geoeconomic push behind it. And I would argue the geopolitical or geoeconomic push behind it is getting a partial economic divorce from China. So I'd like to see us deepen our partnership in the Western Hemisphere. I'd like to see a deeper partnership with Asia. I'd like to revisit a partnership with Europe. I'd like to look at a deeper partnership with Africa. So I think over the next five to 10 years, I think we're going to see that. I think on the other hand, and related to that is, so the other thing I would say, one of my other takeaways from my 500 Zoom calls is there's been more e-government, distance learning, e-commerce, and digital payments in the last 53 weeks than in the last 53 years. And if you want to have modernity in the future and global development, we have like, what what does the last 100 years of literacy look like or toilets or drinkable water or electricity? I'm going to use the term digital because both Ambassador Gross and Bonnie Glick and Karan, all three of them have taught me about like 5G is just, is just kind of like a tech, one technology out of many that we're going to have or one standard. So in my mind, and there's going to be two solutions to, in my view, the last digital divide was closed with this, an iPhone you know, or phones. This is going to require a much more sophisticated digital backbone, but publics all over the world are demanding the closing of this new digital divide. That If we're doing Zoom, everybody's doing Zoom. And so this is either going to get closed by Huawei, ZTE, and PLA.com, or it's going to be solved by OE, the OECD countries. I'd like door number two, please. So, so my final point, uh, Richard, is that I think multilateral institutions have a lot of role to play in all these things. Some of us are on trade. Some of it's on digital standards. So funny named institutions like the OECD or ITU really matter. As I want the West to be a remain a standard maker like VHS versus beta, as opposed to a standard taker. And so I think these institutions matter. How we lead in them matters. We have to remain engaged in them and we have to pay attention to them in in both at a tactical level at a more, it'd be more more clever at a tactical Mm -hmm. level, but also at a strategic level and how we work with our partners. My last Mm -hmm. thing is none of the big problems we're talking about can be solved by any one company, any one government, for any one sector. So we have to work in a collaborative way. I'll stop there. Thank you, Dan. Uh, I'm going to, I want to take a few of those issues back to Karan and to, uh, to David in, in a second, particularly on these issues about working through multilateral institutions and dealing with the fracturing and, and the tech clash that we've also seen. But before, uh, hopefully before the congressman has to, to go, uh, Brendan, I want to come back to you. I think between all the other panelists, and especially I think in, in Dan's very useful wrap up there, You heard a lot of things there. We've all been digitized. We're going to have a partial economic divorce from China. There's going to be tectonic shifts in supply chains. um, And that we need to be thinking about foreign aid and our trade as tools of statecraft. And so reflect there. Pick pick any one of those. But I I particularly also want to hear from you about the digital backbone, the digital infrastructure, because that's something you can write checks for out of the committees you sit on. (laughs) And the good news is, Richard, put your hands over your ears. We're spending so much money, we'll be able to write a lot of it in the next, uh, the next couple of years. 
I just lost the previous speaker with that. But, um, <laughs> now, you know, there, there's so much of what's been said I, I want to comment on, so I'll, I'll attempt to be disciplined here. The first is it was such a, a wise point that it's always been the case that um, our part of what has motivated our trade deals and our trade strategy is our national security strategy. That was certainly the case in, in the Cold War era, but it's still the case today. I mean, whether one agreed or disagreed with the TPP, obviously attempting to um, form a union of Pacific states to combat China f from them being able to write the rules of the road, that was obviously a, a big motivation for it. I right now, and this is kind of a nice intersection of, of two of the committees uh, in which I've served in, in the eight years I've been here, Foreign Affairs and Ways and Means, um, I right now am part of a group that is attempting to work on the early stages of a U.S.-EU trade deal. Uh, before there was an effort called TTIP, uh, I think it was unfortunate that the, the Obama administration moved first on TPP instead of TTIP. Um, that's that's uh, a long story, but I think there was actually a lot more domestic political support for looking uh, toward Europe where they have equal, if not higher, labor and environmental standards than we do. It's a lot easier doing a, a widespread trade agreement with them. But part of my motivation for that is I firmly believe that the transatlantic alliance um, needs to be bolstered. That is both as uh, our traditional role in terms of combating uh, Russia, but it's also as a way to combat the threat from China. Make no mistake about it, China is our major competitor uh, and is not a force overall for good in the world. And I'll say to bring this to domestic politics, in an era in which sadly partisanship is at, I would say, certainly the highest since 1890s, but perhaps and alarmingly the highest since the 1850s, China is the one major issue that brings together a lot of Democrats and Republicans alike. Um, that is an opportunity we should seize. I know there's a bill in the Senate right now that actually the Senate Majority Leader, I, I think, is, is going to be moving forward that has a lot of support over here as well. So um, so I think that, that was a, a very wise point about the link between trade and, and national security. Um, moving forward, that will continue to be the case. What about this issue of uh, the digital backbone? Oh, and right. what, what do we need to do to reinvent... Yeah, I think of like the 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 highway infrastructure that we've built and all of the other things. And I know you said we're spending a lot of money. My concern: the last time we spent a lot of money, we didn't necessarily spend that money very wisely. And I've still I've been promised an infrastructure bill. I think for three presidents now. So when are we going to get like an effective digital infrastructure, like the infrastructure of the twenty first century? Yeah. So I actually I have good news and bad news on on that. The good news is. Believe it or not, it will soon finally be Infrastructure Week uh, in, in the United States of America. The stars really are uh, aligning for this. Um, so I'm highly, now that the American Rescue Plan uh, was passed and, and signed into law, the infrastructure bill is, is the next big thing. So if you're looking for, infra and by infrastructure, I mean both the infrastructure of the 20th century, roads, bridges, rail, electrical grid, water sewer lines, gas lines, I live in a city in which some of our gas lines were laid 150 years ago, mm -hmm. by the way. And if you're, you're in New York City, it's exactly the same. But we can't just look at the infrastructure of the 19th and 20th century. We have to think of the infrastructure of the 21st century. So rural broadband combined with uh, improving broadband access in urban areas, that's also part of it. So all of that, when I said I have good news and bad news for you, Richard, I, I would put that in the good news bucket. When I say the bad news, though, is... I don't think uh, in context of the infrastructure bill, I don't think they're thinking along the same lines that you are in terms mm. of, of digital. We're thinking of it domestically in terms of improving access, but thinking about, you know, how we can be a, a real competitor to, to China. I mean, the fact that as much as I love our European allies, I have to say some of them seem to not see the world toward China the same way I do. Um, you know, Huawei is, is a great example of that. Even the UK that, that tends to be more closely aligned with us in these matters, obviously has a different view of, of China. So 
I would say disappointingly, uh, I don't think we're there in terms of a digital strategy. So Infrastructure Week is coming. Hopefully that's going to come before Shark Week this year. So that, that'll be, be exciting to, to see. Uh, but we, we're not necessarily seeing things eye to eye with our allies. And we do need still this digital infrastructure for the 21st century. Karan, I want to take that to you there at Google. You know, we've seen a lot of tech clash in the recent past. I think a lot of what you as a company are trying to do requires the kind of digitization that Dan alluded to. You know, when you think about what the congressman just said, what, what do we need to do here? And is the future going to be protectionist? And how are we going to see um, the opportunities that could be created by a, a more common view of what's needed for our digital future? Well, a lot in that, Richard. Uh, let me just tease out a few pieces. I mean, first of all, uh, to uh, the point that David and, and others have made, we have to get our policies right here at home, right? We've got to do the right things to allow innovation to continue to, to flourish. It, companies like Google were invented 22 years ago uh, because we have in the United States a climate, uh, uh, a, an infrastructure that allows technology to, to flourish and grow and companies to grow. Today, we were able to announce the creation of 10,000 new jobs in the United States, an investment of $7 billion in the upcoming year in uh, 23 states across the United States. That's because the United States has has allowed companies, has created a regulatory and other infrastructure to allow companies like us uh, to be able to do that and to be able to contribute back. And it is, we are not looking to the government, I can tell you, uh, to uh, fund or, 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 or create sort of an economic incentive for us to do this. We're gonna do it because it's the right thing for us to be able to continue to invest and grow and be able to deliver the products and services that people want. Um, so we're, we're, we're gonna keep doing that. I also want to, I think the congressman made a super important point about the importance of focusing on the transatlantic. And uh, while attention does rightfully turn to Asia, I think that transatlantic area is going to be particularly critical. So to your question, of is there a protectionist future that we're looking at? I really think that to some extent that's going to be determined by what happens on the transatlantic side of things. Um, mm -hmm. And reach a partnership with our European allies over what good policy should be, including in this space of technology policy, I think we've got potentially a bright future because you're going to have a U.S.-Europe combination, which is an extraordinarily still potent economic combination setting rules for the rest of the world. But if we can't, and let me flag one of the challenges here, in fact, is protectionism on the European side. Uh, we have seen an, a alliance on the United States. So now there's a lot behind that and we can unpack why that is. But we've got to have a level playing field on the transatlantic. And so I'm super excited to see the congressman and others reference uh, our leadership in that area. I think that's going to be really important. So back to my point before about uh, trade or international policy really being domestic policy or domestic politics. What I'm kind of hearing you say there is that if we can reconcile with our European allies, that will perhaps open up some doors that would allow us to continue to be play a leadership role as a rule take rule maker rather than a rule taker, as Dan said, uh, and then to have a more constructive relationship with them uh, would allow us to also play a bigger role in a bigger stage. Exactly. So if I, if I, guess, I, yeah, I, I want to come, come, come to you right now. So go ahead. I was going to say, Karan, of course, has got it exactly right. And to pile on for a moment, um, when we talk about Europe, I think it's critically important for U.S. policymakers to continue to think about Europe, both in terms of Brussels, the European Union, but also the member states itself, uh, because uh, the member states, many of them are naturally closer to us than others. Many of them have very different economic, you know, we've, we've all lived through the creation of the European Union. We know the tensions mm -hmm. there uh, associated and then uh, to go to, to Dan's point is that in many of these international organizations, maybe most of the international organizations, Brussels does not represent Europe. The member states represent themselves. And so if you if they mm. feel that somehow we are ignoring them 
because we are focusing on Brussels or vice versa, we end up creating a bigger problem than we need to have. We are, you know, strong enough, we're big enough, we're creative enough to both focus on Brussels and do what is important in Brussels and in capital as well. So we need to we need to make sure that we don't ignore the member states just while we're focusing on the issues that the the union itself uh, might represent. Uh, Bonnie, I want to take this to you though. I mean, one of the things I'm hearing here is that w- w- there's a bunch of old alliances like NATO and our transatlantic relationships that that uh, Brennan referred to, uh, but there's also new and emerging alliances that are coming on the scene. And I want to p- pose two things to you. One. I've heard many people describe or several people describe the Trans-Pacific Partnership as economic NATO for Asia, a way of trying to um, gather our Asian allies and protect them from, you know, in, in this analogy, China, as opposed to the Soviet Union during during the NATO period uh, of the Cold War. And secondly, that China plays more of a power trader role where they are, as they said, manipulating the system to their advantage. So. What do you see as the evolving role of things like NATO, the Quad, the Abraham Accords, and and how how can we make best use of both new and old alliances? That is a a very uh, fulsome question. Uh, (laughs) And how about if we look at it sort of... uh, What's old is new, uh, and what's new is new, maybe. Uh, NATO is one of the strongest and most enduring alliances in history. And it's not because it's composed of 30 identical countries, and this is to David's point, but precisely because it's composed of 30 countries who have joined for the purpose of ensuring their own national defense strategies. So it isn't 30 clones that all look and act the same. It's 30 distinct actors. And one of the interesting dynamics in today's NATO, which is composed of the original Western European members and now members of the Warsaw Pact and parts of the former Soviet Union. I mean, it's a little bit mind blowing when you think about the history of it. And that's an extraordinary combination with with all of us representing first our own flags and secondarily representing NATO's. So, you know, we all remember one of the things that President Trump did was announce that he expected NATO members to behave as the U.S. does when it comes to contributions to this alliance, because an alliance should include everyone's contributions. And it shook up the alliance, but mostly it shook up some of the original members of NATO. The president said, you know, we want NATO members to pay what he called their fair share monetarily into the defense of the region. And that honestly is not an unfair expectation, right? We're allies. He was acting on behalf of the American taxpayers who want their contributions to be valued. And what better way to value them than to match them? But that's the, what's old as new. So we're trying to take up things in NATO, recognizing the criticality of it to the national and in global security order. But then there are these new things happening that I find so electrifying and exciting. And things like the Quad uh, and Secretary Blinken and um, and the Secretary of Defense just had uh, meetings with their Quad partners, India, Japan, and Australia. Uh, and this is probably one of the most interesting alliances that you can think of for the United States. We recognize now that the great capabilities of the world won't be solely defined by Europe. And that's kind of refreshing when you think about it. Many of the world's greatest historical and contemporary innovations have come from the East and not the West. So the Quad, to me, feels very natural. And maybe it wouldn't have been that way 20 years ago when India still felt more closely aligned with the global south. But India has come into its own as a powerful global economy, as a center of innovation. And frankly, as we've seen in its recent skirmishes with China, it's a force to be reckoned with. So teaming India, Japan, and Australia together with the United States makes all the sense in the world. Uh, The Indo-Pacific is the most strategic part of the world today. 
and combining forces and innovation to invest not only in each other, but also in Southeast Asia will prove to be the greatest military and economic investments, I think, of this generation. The Abraham Accords you mentioned to me are also tremendously revealing. When you look at creative statesmanship, this will be the case study. Mm. Every president of the modern era has determined that his will be the administration that brings peace to the Middle East. Uh, and it's only over you know, 40 years. Uh, there have been two peace treaties until last September. And in September 2020, when the Abraham Accords were signed between Israel, the UAE, and Bahrain, uh, there have now been three more countries that have agreed to normalize relations with Israel, Morocco, Sudan, and Kosovo. Five normalizations in the last five months of the Trump administration, and one with Indonesia was very close to closing, and I hope that the Biden team picks up with that and runs with it, mm -hmm. because the Abraham Accords proved that there's a way forward when you think about a problem differently. Mm -hmm. And that's something that I think we can all benefit from. So, uh, Dan, I want to come to you. Thank you, Bonnie. Um, I want to come to you for one last question, and then I'm going to go back. We're about the four-minute mark, and I'm going to go back and ask everybody for a lightning round on one thing that they think our, our, our audience should take forward from today's discussion. But, Dan, what I, what I heard from Bonnie there is that we have sort of a dyna dynamic marketplace of alliances out there, a lot of changing roles, changing responsibilities, changing players, uh, you referred to some of these like kind of funny named UN agencies. Where, where do you see this kind of competition playing out? Where should the United States be paying more attention? Should we be paying, paying more to the UN, the, the UN system, or in some of these other uh, alliances that Bonnie refers to? Yeah, thanks a lot. I think that if you'd put a gun in my head two years ago and said, "What is WIPO?" I just said, "I don't know what that is." Now the folks on the call know what it is, and a lot of your audience knows what it is. But a lot of smart people may not know what the World Intellectual Property Organization is. And I went online to say, "Is there a white boat for dummies?" And there was no white boat for dummies. And so we put one together at CSIS, and then it was clear that the U.S. government needed to pick a candidate, and so we convened. So there needs to be some midwifery of. You know, getting a national consensus on candidates. We need to understand what the stakes are for some of these things. We've got to do a far better job of understanding what these institutions can do, at least. And we need to keep control and maintain control of the commanding heights of the multilateral system. Now, if China wants to run the International Association of Tiddlywinks, I'm fine with that. But if they want to take control of WIPO, we got a problem. So we need to discern between the the Tiddlywinks Association and WIPO. And some of these things have funny names I started to figure out. It was the same with the OECD race. Um, I was very involved with that. And there were came down to a very set of qualified candidates. Thankfully, we got the right candidate. We got the right outcome. We got a, a new secretary general from Australia. He's very qualified. He's excellent. He's going to meet American interest in a wide swath of other member states' interests. But we had to do that in a cooperative way. We had to work with our allies and we had to understand what the stakes were. We need to know what our interests were. We had to understand where our allies were coming from, and we need to work together. And we're going to see this consistently. I, and so I, I, I do have a, a deep thought for the, my lat for the lighting round. I'll stop there. Okay. So th thank you for that. And, and what I'm taking away from what you said, but also from the whole panel, is that really what we need to do is build a consensus, a domestic consensus, and then an allied consensus for what we want this kind of future to look like. And that's missing right now. So my question to all of you and your takeaways, if you can reflect on, if you were to tell our audience one thing that they should go think, feel, or do about building that a consensus, what should that be? And uh, Congressman Boyle, I'm gonna come to you first. Yeah, well, thanks. That's a tough question. Um, I, let me say uh, first the, your penultimate question, uh, Richard, and as part of this, Building a domestic consensus on any of these issues will be a lot more difficult than building a consensus with our allies. Working in these areas, attempting to make this relevant to the daily lives and interests of the three quarters of a million people in Philadelphia who I represent is a very uh, difficult challenge, frankly. Um, and, and so for all of us moving forward, if we could work on one thing 
What I would say is how we can um, reach out to our friends, neighbors, work colleagues, and make them more interested in topics like NATO, US European uh, closer integration and working together, um, how we can stand up to, to China uh, and work collectively, how we can continue to advance the world. Again, I repeat that the US helped create and has led for the last three quarters of a century. WIPO didn't make your list there though. But, <laughs> now, I think that's a really profound thought. I hadn't really, you kind of made me sit back in my chair there on, on the fact that this is going to be harder to build it domestically than it is with our allies. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Carson Boyle. Bonnie Glick, over to you. Your one thought. My one thought is the congressman shocked me by that comment. Uh, and-